partnership, post-industrial economics, and a little bit about puppies. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, my guest is Rian Eisler, author of the land-breaking book Chalice and the Blade, and also The Real Wealth of Nations. Rian Eisler will be my guest for the program. You're watching The Laura Flanders Show, the place where the people who say it can't be done take a back seat to the people who are doing it. Welcome. I was born in Europe, in Vienna, at a time, well, of massive social regression to what I call a domination system. It was the rise to power of the Nazis, first in Germany and then in my native Austria. So from one day to the next, my whole world collapsed and my parents and I, we became hunted with license to kill. And it was only by a hair's breadth. We were actually um, one of the last ships to Cuba, uh, before one that was turned back to St. Louis. That ship was not permitted to land anywhere. It had to go back to Europe. And of course, many of the people on board were murdered by the Nazis, as happened to most of my family, grandparents, aunts, uncles, cousins. That's just a little bit of the history of Rian Eisler, today's guest. Rian, watching that video, I'm struck that not everybody with your experience would have dedicated themselves to fighting domination. A lot of people determined that they're going to dominate when they've been through something like that. What do you think determined your course of, of interest and curiosity and work? Well, I think that um, it wasn't just one factor. It never is. But for me, uh, being always having been a very curious child, uh, it was very shocking. So where did you begin? Because your research takes you way back into history. Yeah, you know, it's very strange, Laura, but my life uh, is really like a, a, the pieces of a jigsaw puzzle coming together. I had no idea when I became as a kind of going crazy housewife in the suburbs of Los Angeles, uh, that the fact that I became so interested in prehistoric so-called mystery cults, that that would be an avenue for me to really look at our prehistory, try to understand how come there were all of these powerful female deities. Mm -hmm. what, what did that mean in terms, because art reflects and perpetuates social systems. Um, of course, my first job out of school, before I went back to law school, was with the Systems Development Corporation. And so I learned about systems analysis before anybody had a clue about what that meant. Mm -hmm. What it means is that you have to look at the whole picture and that really the parts of a picture are what you have to understand, how they interconnect and mutually support each other. And what did you learn that was a departure from the traditional analysis of, of what cultures, of, of the cultures that you were studying? Well, I learned that uh, underlying our conventional system of classifications, right, left, religious, secular, eastern, western, uh, northern, southern, are really two configurations. And the only way you can see these is if, as I did in this very systemic study of society, you take into account parts of the picture that are left out of the usual uh, 
social analyses. And by that, I mean very specifically the situation of the majority of humanity, women and children. But I also, as I said, I went to, into a database that includes prehistory. And so it became clear to me that there were some patterns that kept repeating themselves historically and cross-culturally. There were no names for them. I called one, therefore, uh, for obvious reasons, the domination system, because it's really based on people thinking there are only two alternatives. You either dominate or you're dominated. And I called the other one the partnership system. And of course, no society is, is a pure partnership or domination system, but depending on the degree of orientation, like the regression to domination that I was born into, was a pure domination system. And you have to, to understand how that could happen in this, quote, civilized nation. You also have to understand that the family in Germany was really the origin of the identification with the strong person of where caring and coercion are, is a confluence between them. So the family becomes one of the cornerstones by which you analyze systems. Absolutely. We'll get to that. But before we do, I want you to go back to the history for just a minute because it was so fascinating. You say that we had 30,000 years of partnership and you look at communities or societies like Crete or Mycenae and you see this partnership. Some people have talked about matriarchy. You don't. It's fascinating how our language keeps us trapped. And, and uh, really, linguistic psychologists have remarked that categories, and social categories are categories, channel our thinking. So what is really matriarchy and patriarchy? They're two sides of a domination coin. Neither is really the alternative. A partnership is the alternative. So what did you see that made you think that those 30,000 years were engaged in partnership? And then, of course, the big question, what the heck happened? to change things? Well, I deal with all of that at some length in The Chalice and the Blade, in Sacred Pleasure, etc. But, you know, I want to say something. Actually, it was millennia mm. where partnership was more the norm. And my colleague, uh, Douglas Fry, who is the expert, he's done a couple of Oxford University books on the subject, he studied foraging societies. And the story we've been told is all crazy. Because if you look at contemporary foraging societies, plus the evidence that we have, and, and you see it without the blinkers, you see that they were more partnership oriented and they were not warlike or male dominated. Mm -hmm. You, in The Chalice and the Blade, write that most of our most important innovations of so-called civilization actually date to that period, which also runs counter to oh, our yes. theories. Well, of course. I mean, we're told, I mean, it, there's so many contradictory theories to explain, that is, to rationalize, justify the domination system we are trying to get out of. I mean, so much of modern history, especially in the West, uh, despite all of our problems and domination heritage, has been challenging one tradition of domination after another. It's a unified movement if you look at it through those lenses. But the thing is that we don't do that. Mm -hmm. And we have this very fragmented view of history. Coming to the present, you predicted the Trump election long before it happened. How well, so? In 2007, just to give you one example, I wrote an op-ed for Alternet. And I said in that op-ed that I wrote that, hey, there's an issue that we have given away, family, values, and morality. And it's going to, it, it is really what's making it possible for this regression which already, you know, was in, in, I mean, Trump is just sort of, you know, the culmination of decades. Uh, the Rightist Fundamentalist Alliance, which came together really to defeat the Equal Rights Amendment, uh, spent enormous resources, time, effort on changing the normative ideal for families. So in that op-ed I wrote that in 1992, 
polls showed that if you asked a sample of Americans, uh, do you agree that the father is the master of the house? At that time, 42% uh, said yes. By 2004, it had increased to 52%. Even as more families had no male head. Well, you know, it doesn't really matter. It's a normative idea. Concept. It's what we're taught we should be. And uh, that's, you know, I mean, what, what is traditional family? Traditional family is a code word, isn't it? For a rigidly male-dominated, authoritarian, highly punitive family where children learn two lessons. One is that you better obey orders no matter how unjust because it's painful not to, very painful. And two, they learn to equate difference, beginning with the difference between male and female with superiority, inferiority, dominating or being dominated, uh, being served and serving. And then that generalizes itself in the, we know from neuroscience, you know, that the brain is formed to such a large extent in those early years, uh, it is manifests itself in racism, anti-Semitism, but it's, it's Shiite, Af in, uh, you know, against Sunni, it's Muslim against Buddhist, it's mm. wherever, okay, I mean, and, and... And the family is just one of your four cornerstones. Absolutely. So talk about some of the others. Well, uh, You mentioned gender. Gender certainly is very, very important. Uh, economics, but I look at economics from a very different perspective than the, I think we've got to get out of this old debate of capitalism versus socialism. I mean, look, they came out of the 1700s, the 1800s, it was early industrial times. We're in the 21st century post-industrial age. I say they're, they're Einsteinian theories and we need quantum. Absolutely. And so, and they both really, I mean, for both. Newtonian and Einsteinian, I guess. Yeah, well, for both uh, Smith and Marx, nature was there to be exploited. Yep. And so was the women's work of caring for people starting in early childhood. This is totally dysfunctional, has caused enormous damage to people, to nature. But right now, it's impossible because we really need to invest in human capacity development. And we know again from neuroscience that the quality of care that children receive early on is foundational. So how would this change? And we've talked on this program before about how we um, treasure what we measure. Yes. You say we should measure some different things. Care would be a nice thing to measure and actually pay for it, wouldn't it? Yes. Well, that's the whole premise of my book, The Real Wealth of Nations. Not the whole premise because, you know, it analyzes. But the, one of the basic premises is that we've been operating with a partial economic map that really ignores, as part of what is the domain of economics, the three life-sustaining sectors, the natural economy, the volunteer economy, and the household economy. So uh, we developed, to answer your question about metrics, um, new measures that are different not only from GDP, but from most GDP alternatives, because for one thing, they do show the enormous economic value of the work of caring in homes, mm -hmm. not only in the market where it's, of course, look, as if, if women are devalued, this is systems analysis, mm -hmm. then anything associated stereotypically with being a woman, with femininity, with, quote, softness, doing is it. devalued, whoever is doing it. So you can't realistically expect caring policies, whether it's caring for nature or caring for people. And so we're really talking about a whole different approach, what I call partnerism or a caring economics. And language is the last part. Well, this is where you come in. <laughs> Uh, because really, uh, the narratives, the narratives, especially the narratives about uh, our past, our present, and the possibilities yeah. for our future, are so screwed up. You know, I mean, people say, oh, 
capitalism is the answer. And others say, well, socialism is the answer. Well, look at the two mass applications of socialism in China and in the former Soviet Union. A disaster. Why? Because you cannot understand or change economics without understanding and changing if it is one orienting, obviously, as it was in both these places, to the domination yeah. side. Economics will perpetuate that. So whether it's a feudal lord or a king or a pasha or, quote, trickle-down economics, which is dominator economics. And we've talked on this program with Rick Wolf and others about state socialism not involving the kind of transformation, even of the workplace, that would actually issue in the kind of life experience that, that you talk about. You talk about a, a revolution of caring. Yes, a caring a, revolution. We don't have a whole lot more time, but just briefly, where do you see we are along the way towards that? Uh, we says, are hope. taking baby steps, okay. but we are taking them. Mm -hmm. And see, if you look at history really as a, not as, as linear, but as a spiral with dips, uh, as I said, all the progressive social movements, whether it's the so-called rights of man or the feminism or uh, civil rights, uh, have challenged traditions of domination. But we're at a place where caring is beginning and we've had something to do with that at the Center for Partnership Studies with our Caring Economy campaign. Uh, it's at least being talked about. And there is a push. And this is a question of tactics, uh, because the strategy is obviously a cultural transformation, paying attention to these four cornerstones. But a very important tactic is enacting uh, laws that support care work, like the Nordic nations have, invest in our people and invest in nature, paid parental leave, uh, early childhood education. Uh, we have the highest child poverty rate in this country and invest the least in our children. This is not coincidental. So I can see reasons for hope and optimism in many of your areas of cornerstones. I think the conversation around transgender and trans identities is yes. a positive move. The discussion around intersectionality is to answer your question, your very first answer, things are complicated. Um, no identity is, is uni, unilateral, as it were. Um, in the area of narratives and language, I see concentration, domination, and sort of megaphone making of meaning. And also a complete fragmentation of consciousness. Yeah. I mean, the, uh, all of these wonderful technologies we have, uh, they are distractions. And I worry about what's happening to young people who so desperately want a new way of being, not just thinking. And they're spending their days rating each other and giving each yeah. other thumbs up and I mean, thumbs down. But the thing about it is this. Look, uh, determination persistence, and language. I think uh, for people who have really understood the configurations of the partnership and domination systems, it's been life-changing. If we can change the language to start talking about dismantling our domination heritage, and if we understand the four cornerstones we have to work on for partnership, and like the regressives, have an integrated integrated progressive agenda that doesn't just try to dismantle the top. It's great talking to you, Rihanna. I have one last question, and maybe it's a big one. But when I read Chalice and the Blade, which I encourage everybody to read, th there is an explanation. You do talk about how this transition happened. And you point the finger of blame at nomadic tribes that came and disrupted societies of partnership. I wonder about that. I isn't it always an outsider who comes in and wrecks our beautiful golden age? Are you sure that's what happened? Or was there something in us? Because I feel there is a tendency in each of us also. I'm training a puppy right now. I'm deeply into domination. Um, <laughs> but, not, but seriously, is it outside influence that wrecks the golden age? Or is it something in us? 
Well, let's start with your puppy. <laughs> as adorable as puppies are, we are not puppies. Correct. And we are really uh, not as completely dependent on, I mean, once we grow up, for our food, Thanks for our while. shelter. Uh, so, yes, I mean, you're in a position where, you know, that's it. But look, we can. Uh, I've, uh, I've been writing a, a new book, uh, drawing also from how our brains develop, drawing from neuroscience, differently in partnership and domination-oriented environments. And we have, by the grace of evolution, we humans have enormous capacities for consciousness, for caring, for creativity, but we also have the capacities for insensitivity, for cruelty, and for destructiveness. The issue, and it's very simple in a way, and that was what I sought to understand. I mean, we've come full circle, in a sense, from the video, you, sh you know, about my early life. Uh, what are the conditions that support the expression of either one of these two bundles? Not perfect, but so I don't agree that there's something in us. I think that actually our most felt human need is for caring connection. So why so much dominance? Well, we've inherited this, and it's been going for about, you know, 3,000-some years, 5,000-some years in some areas. Uh, it takes time. Because once a system is established, you get systems self-maintenance. Mm -hmm. but, but our time, I said earlier that the shift, the last 300 years uh, of, the sh of the shift from an agrarian to an industrial age were a time where a lot of the givens of the domination system. I mean, look at the European Middle Ages. I mean, mm -hmm. my God, it looked like the Taliban, right? Inquisition, crusades, witch burnings. I mean, no rights, human rights. I mean, what? You... We now, in this time of the shift, and it's a rapid shift, from the industrial to the post-industrial age, yes, it's a crisis. Of course, automation, robotics, uh, artificial intelligence, that's why we need a, a completely different economic system, partnerism. Uh, but we also have the opportunity for fundamental change, including redefining what is and is not productive work. Rianne Eisler, thank you so much for being with us. It's great to talk with you. Appreciate it. Thank you for your work. Thank you, Laura. You can find out more about Rianne Eisler's work, the Center for Partnership Studies, and all her books at our website. Thanks for watching. Holiday shopping lists on your mind? Gift subscriptions to newspapers and magazines were big last year. Subscriptions to newspapers like the New York Times and the Washington Post spiked soon after the election. As the penny seemed to have dropped for many Americans, that without an informed electorate, we have a pretty dodgy democracy. A year on, American democracy is in even bigger trouble. While the conventional wisdom has it that the Trump White House has been ineffective, at the Federal Communications Commission, they've been getting a lot done, and none of it good for public journalism. Historically, the mission of the FCC has been to regulate the public airwaves for the public interest by promoting, among other things, localism, competition, and diversity. Administrations of both parties have taken mighty whacks at that, but coming into the Trump administration, the FCC was a wounded beast, all ready for Federal Communications Chair Ajit Pai to deliver a death stroke to. Pai has held meetings all year, pushing repeal of the remaining ownership limits, a vote's likely to take place at the Commission's meeting in December. Pai is a Republican, former staffer to Jeff Sessions, now Attorney General. He leads the Commission's Republican majority in lockstep. Mergers penned, among them ATT with Time Warner. Just think what that would do to your phone and cable bill. The administration's priority, though, is to pave the way for the Sinclair Broadcasting Company the nation's largest TV owner, to buy the troubled Tribune Group, which
which would expand their holdings to 233 TV stations, reaching three quarters of the U.S. population. Sinclair is beyond friendly to the Trump agenda. The company has hired Trump colleagues to serve as its lead propagandists. Local Sinclair stations are required to play their daily commentaries under a must-carry rule that is strictly enforced. Mergers aren't all. In November, the commission voted essentially to kill Lifeline, the $9.25 a month subsidy program for low-income people. That's what was helping to pay for communications in many places that are the only way that patients reach doctors and nurses, even suicide hotline. Media monopoly hits every demographic, but none more so than the local, the rural, the least affluent, the most vulnerable. Along with access to food and water and electricity, access to communications means a difference between life and death. If we don't put public interest media back into the heart of our social justice agenda, we are giving away our democracy to the people with the deepest pockets. What do I really want for Christmas? A few huge, sexy, monopoly-busting, local media funding antitrust lawsuits. If you've got any in the offing, let me know. You can write to me, laura at lauraflanders.com. And thanks. Mm -hmm.